All right, today we are going to talk about pay to play provisions. Now, if you're not familiar with these, they're not super well known. And frankly, like not a lot of people talk about them because usually when a pay to play provision occurs in venture capital, it's not really a good thing. But every time that you see a company that has a bunch of layoffs, you can kind of tell that they're struggling there is a decently high chance that there is a pay to play provision in their future. Let's talk about what a pay to play provision actually is. Pay to play provision basically is a tool that investors can use to encourage other investors to help support a company. This is how it generally works. Let's say that you've got a company and they need $5 million because if they don't get that $5 million, they're probably gonna go out of business, right? But your anchor investors, they only want to put in like $2 million. To understand pay to play provisions, you also need to know what pro rata is. A pro rata right, simply put, is like what's your ownership of the company and your corresponding obligation or opportunity based on that ownership. So like for example, oftentimes you see pro rata rights, which is simply a right to invest in the company to maintain your ownership level. And so for example, if I've got a $10 million company valuation and I own 10% of that company and they decide that they are going to raise an additional $5 million into the company, well, that's going to dilute my ownership. And so a pro rata right essentially allows me to invest $500,000 in that round and allow me to maintain my ownership percentage because that would give us a $15 million valuation on the back end and I would continue to own 10%. So those are the basics of, pay, of, of pro rata rights. That's important because in a pay to play scenario, oftentimes what happens is let's say the company needs to raise money and they are going through a really tough time. So other investors that aren't investors in the company already aren't willing to invest. And the insiders are looking at it and saying, hey, we think that there's an opportunity here for this company to make it to that milestone, but they just need a little bit more capital, right? Imagine that you are in a boat as a startup and you're rowing and you make it halfway across the lake and you lose your paddle. So you are in a tough spot because you need to make it through the rest of the way. And so you ask your investors if they'll lend you a paddle. Now, your investors in that case are in a really strong situation because you're kind of stuck in the middle of the lake, right? This happens to startups quite a bit, right? They raise money and something happens, right? Lots of things can happen in startup land. It's a very risky place and they don't quite make it to that milestone that allows them to raise more money from other investors and they're in a tough spot. Well, some of your investors may want to encourage all the other investors that are also in your deal to pony up money because it's not really fair for them to kick in the money to buy you the ore, to get you to cross the lake, and then everybody benefits in the upside from that. And so what they'll do is they'll put in place what's called a pay to play provision. Now in the pay to play provision, they will essentially require that all investors pony up an investment relative to their ownership in the company. Let's say the company needs $5 million and the investors as a whole represent 60% of the ownership. And of this 60% of the ownership, let's say the lead investors own about 50% of that. So essentially 30% of the business is owned by your lead investors. They'll then kick in half of this $5 million. So they're gonna put in 2.5 million. Well, the other 50% of this 60% ownership needs to come from the other inside investors. And so to encourage them to do that, they'll have this pay to play provision that basically says, if you don't invest and you force us to have to kick in additional money to cover your spot, then what we're gonna do is we're gonna take your investment, we're going to convert it from preferred shares to common shares, and typically what they'll do on top of that is they'll also do a reverse stock split. So a very common one is like 10 to one. So we're gonna take 10 of your preferred shares and we're gonna convert them into one common share. That effectively wipes out a lot of investors because if you own 10% of the company, you're going to end up owning 1% of the company if you don't participate in this. And if that 10% costs you a million dollars, now your stake is only worth 100k. So it can be very punitive. In fact, it can get even worse. In some cases, I've seen pay to play provisions where it's 50 to 1. It basically just completely wipes you off the cap table. Now, the other big thing is you get converted from preferred 
to common. That's important because preferred shares typically come with a lot of different rights. They could come with pro rata rights, that ability to keep investing to maintain your ownership in the future. They come with information rights, so the ability to know what's going on within the company. Most importantly, probably, they come with liquidation preference rights. Now, liquidation preference basically provides downside protection in the in the event that a company goes under. What it basically says is that preferred shareholders will get paid back their investment amount before common shareholders get paid back. And this is important because let's say a company has raised $10 million and the company sells for $9 million. Well, in that case, even if preferred shares don't own the entire company, they're gonna get paid the entire $9 million and common shares will get nothing. And when a company is really struggling and they have to put in place a pay to play provision, the likelihood of them being in that scenario where they end up selling for less money than they've raised in total is very likely. And if you get wiped to common, you effectively lose all of your downside protection. So in that case, it's not even so bad that like you get reduced down to 100K it gets worse because your likelihood of even getting that 100K becomes a lot less likely. So why do these pay to play provisions get put in place? Well, as you can probably tell, they get put in place when a company is not doing particularly well and they need help. And that's ultimately why I wanted to talk about them right now, because we're gonna see a lot of pay to play provisions popping up, I believe, over the next 12 months. As we head into a recession and as capital becomes more scarce, what you're gonna see is companies are gonna really struggle to raise additional capital to continue funneling growth. And they're gonna to have to go back to their inside investors. And their large inside investors are probably not going to want to pony up lots of cash into these businesses. Most of these investors are going to be trying to conserve cash as much as they can because they'll have many different portfolio companies that they need to support. And so they'll be doing things to encourage other investors who also have the same mentality of like, I'm gonna deploy as little capital into my current startups as I have to so that I have as much cash as possible for follow on needs, especially for these pay to play provisions where they have to pony up money to protect their investment. And so that's that dynamic becomes kind of this vicious cycle where because nobody really wants to pony up money right now, there's going to be more incentive to put in place these pay to play provisions to force everybody to put money in. The other thing is that I think the really smart entrepreneurs have already made a lot of cuts to their business and already went out and raised money from their investors to give them runway for the next couple of years. But they did so at a sacrifice to valuation, which they were willing to do because they understood that now is a pivotal time to make sure they had that runway. There have been a lot of other entrepreneurs that have said, hey, I don't want to take a hit on valuation or I, you know, we've grown so much. We deserve to be a much higher valued company and I'm just gonna wait until the markets recover. I worry that markets aren't gonna fully recover and they're gonna be in a tough spot where they're gonna need more money in the future, which is why I think you're gonna see more and more pay to play provisions pop up over the next six to 12 months as these companies run out of money and have to go back to their investors and say, hey, you guys got a pony up more, we're gonna go out of business and you're gonna lose your entire investment. And that's in turn going to encourage those investors to put these provisions in place to encourage the rest of investors to put in the money necessary to get the company the runway they need. And ultimately it could end up being very damaging to investors and to entrepreneurs when these, these provisions can, get put into place. From my experience, pay to play provisions are tough because when they get pulled out, it really means that the company is in a tough spot and it's pretty unlikely that the company is gonna be able to turn things around and have a massive outcome. And that always begs the question as an investor of whether or not you should put more money in as a, under a pay to play scenario because even if it's a relatively small amount, it could be just, you know, more money going after bad. In some cases, it takes total sense to not participate in the pay to play, to let your shares and your prior investment get converted from preferred to common and then split from 10 to one or 50 to one or whatever it might be. Because at the end of the day, sunk costs are sunk. You made that investment. It really doesn't have any future impact on your future and your dollars today. And so there is a logical and reasonable argument to be made that, hey, if, a comp if you believe that the company can't turn things around, then you really shouldn't put any more dollars in. All right, so that was a lot. I hope that was helpful in terms of understanding what a pay to play provision is and getting some inside baseball into topics that typically aren't talked about in venture capital. If you've enjoyed this video, check out some of our other ones, like when will valuations get back to their 2021 levels, which secret, they probably won't. Thanks. Oh,